I am here uh, interviewing James. I'm sorry, you go. James E. Quint. Is right. that your name? Right. All right. And you were born in 1925. December 3rd, Biloxi, Mississippi. In Biloxi, on the coast. And you currently live, where do you currently live? Where do you live now? Now, 1554 South Montclair Circle in Mobile. All right. What branch of the service did you serve in? Marine Corps. In the Marine Corps? Yes, sir. Where did you, where was your basic training? Where did you go? In uh, San Diego Boot Camp, California. All right. How old were you when you went into the 17. service? 17. 17. You, you had to get some permission from your parents? Correct. Were they okay with that? Uh, were they, did they, they were okay with that? Uh, yeah, I was going anyway, so I thought I had to forge a signature, I was going. <laughs> what year did you join the service? Uh, 1943. So the war had been going on for, for a few a couple years. years right? You knew it was coming. Yeah. How did that make you and your peer group, your friends, feel in high school when you knew this was approaching? Well, in high school, uh, a lot of them didn't finish. They left before their senior year was finished so they could volunteer rather than be drafted. And most of them went from Biloxi into the Navy. Uh, very few, I think me and two of us went to the Marine Corps. What? How did you decide to go into the Marine Corps instead of the Navy? Well, I, I originally wanted to go in the Air Force and be a pilot. Then a friend of mine went in the Marine Corps before I did. He wrote me a letter about being on uh, boot camp, firing an M1 rifle, and uh, throwing hand grenades and so forth. I said, that sounds like something I'd rather do, So, because I love to shoot. So I thought, well, if I get in the Marine Corps, I can f hopefully get on the Douglas Dauntless dive bomber and shoot the machine gun and drop bombs too. But uh, in boot camp, there were 53 of us in the platoon, 63. And uh, I uh, uh, decided then, uh, uh, only two of us got to choose where we were going. And my good buddy uh, ahead of me got picked instead of me. And he was from Iowa. And several years after the war was over, um, was a pharmacist working in a drugstore in Biloxi, and he came by to see me, and uh, hadn't seen him since several years before in boot camp, but he got the aviation job, and he got shot down twice over the Pacific, so I'm glad he got it instead of me. I bet. <laughs> I'm going to digress a moment. Sure. I am. My name is Mike Lyons. We are in Fairhope, Alabama, and uh, we're doing this recording for the Library of Congress. And uh, I am, we are not related in any way, but uh, I am very honored to do this. So let me get back on track here. Um, did you have siblings? I'm sorry? Did you have any brothers or sisters? Uh, I had, oh yeah, I had uh, two brothers uh, and a sister, all three of them. I was the youngest in the family. And one of the brothers went into the 31st CB Battalion and he was the one that was with me on Iwo Jima. It so happened there, uh, CB Battalion was attached to the 5th Marine Division. And I was in a tent one night in Hawaii, a six-man tent, and my buddy called me from next door. I'd borrowed a pen to write home. I said, Fitz, I'll be out in just a minute. When I went outside, somebody tackled me from the back and we fought and wrestled on the ground. He pinned me down, I looked up, there was my brother. And they were right, probably 100 yards away in the area, in the tent, tent city, where we were. So, uh, like I say, he was with me in Japan to occupy, plus being on Iwo Jima. Okay, I want to ask you about your, your school class. Uh, how, do you remember about how many people were in that uh, I class? I think it was about 90. How many of those boys went to war? Uh, all of them did. Um, of course, when I left, there was still a, not too many of them left at home, because I was probably the youngest in the class, and uh, we all went in the service. 
that's that's amazing. Yeah, I, I didn't expect it. I didn't expect a ratio that high. That's amazing. Yeah. Uh, so you were seventeen. <clears throat> Did you have a girlfriend at the time? No, no. Okay. All I right. got one. Never mind. <laughs> so you got one now, right? Yeah, but she doesn't know about it. Right? That's right. <laughs> Your wife doesn't know about it. Yeah. Okay. Tell me, uh, did you so did you have a specialty in the service? I was a, a field artillery crewman. We had a what was called a pack howitzer, very short, seventy-five millimeter pack howitzer, and I think there was like eleven of us to a crew, and I was a gunner on the. Uh, uh, Field piece on the artillery piece. Does that did that shoot an exploding round? Is that right? So did that shoot an yeah, exploding oh yeah, round? Yeah, yeah, right. We fired both. Uh, well, indirect fire. It would go up, and then toward the end of the Iwo Jima campaign, me and one other fellow went up front and uh, fired direct fire with some others from the crew and fired direct fire at Japanese pillboxes instead of like this, we were firing direct. What kind of range was that? Uh, the longest range was about four and a half miles, but firing point blank, oh, probably 50 yards, wow. something like that. And uh, they knew where our position was on top of this ridge, and right next to us was a 37 millimeter anti-tank crew and they had been up there for several days and the Japs knew where they were. So every once in a while, we would shoot and you'd hear them, and they would shoot and we would shoot. And of course the Japanese would run out their foxholes and they would take, they had a elevating and traversing hand wheel on those anti-tank guns. They would fire run one round at one Japanese soldier, one round. So I went over there one time and said, look, every time we pull the lanyard and fire this thing, that's $18.75 war bond going out that barrel. And I said, I don't know what your rounds cost, but it'd be a lot cheaper instead of using your 37 millimeter in the tank gun as a sniping gun to do it with your rifle. So. <laughs> that seems like common sense to me. <laughs> and they all were, they wouldn't even wear steel helmets. They wore baseball caps. They were crazy. <laughs> <laughs> the tank, the anti-tank division. Yeah. <laughs> okay, so let me back up. You you trained in Sa uh, San Diego. Diego. That's right. right. How long? How long? Seven did that weeks. Take? We had uh, three weeks in San Diego. Then the next three weeks were spent out on the rifle range at Camp Matthews, north of San Diego. Then. Uh, we did a lot of, of course, dry firing and so forth. And then uh, the seventh week, we started firing lime ammunition on the rifle range and uh, then qualified. And I missed expert by just about three points. Uh, that would have changed everything, wouldn't it? Uh, it would have. But then I thought, well, while we were on the rifle range, I happened to look up and I saw this Marine walking by in the distance with his name stenciled on the back of his jacket, a boy I'd gone to high school with. And he came over and gave me a cigar. I said, George, what is this for? He said, I just fired high expert. Well, when he finished, he went to scout sniper school and he was killed on Peleliu in invasion. Where did you go from San Diego? Did you go to From San Diego, we were forming the, that was a latter part of 43 and 44 and they were forming the 5th Marine Division at Camp Pendleton, California, at north of Dago. And uh, went up there and joined the 5th and the 13th Regiment, of course, which was an artillery regiment. And they had three infantry regiments, 26, 27, 28th Marines. I was in the 13th Regiment, which was artillery. How long did it take you to progress from basic training to the actual battlefield? Well, that was 43, 45 was a battlefield, and probably not quite two years. It took a little while. Yeah. Okay. How much time did you spend in Hawaii? In Hawaii? Uh, got over there the summer of uh, 
44, uh, stayed there, went to Iwo Jima, came back after Iwo Jima. We were getting ready to invade Japan when they dropped the atomic bomb. Thank the good Lord for it. That's why I'm here today. But they dropped the bomb and then uh, we went and occupied Japan. We were the first troops into the southernmost island of Sasebo. And uh, when we went in, we went into the place we had gone into. Had we invaded, we went to the same place. And we never would have made it. They had no beaches. The mountains came like this right down to the ocean, and the guns were sticking up like this from those cliffs. So that bomb killed a lot of Japanese, but uh, it saved a lot of them too, plus a lot of us. All right, so let's talk about Iwo Jima. <clears throat> At what point of that uh, attack did you come in? What? what which wave did you come in on the, on the, with uh, I came in on the second day. I didn't go in on the first wave. And um, from there, uh, <coughs> excuse me, <coughs> they first told us that uh, we probably wouldn't even go in, that uh, we had three divisions, third, fourth, and fifth, which was about 75,000 Marines, 25 in each division, 25. And it became apparent real quick that we would go in. So it was about the second, about the third day that uh, I went in. And uh, we had, uh, I had, thank goodness I didn't get any scratches, but had about three close calls on the island, very close. Uh, at one point, would you be interested in that? Yes, please. At one point, of course we had to kneel down, and there was no protection anywhere. Uh, and the Japs had every, position on that island. The island was so small, everything was zeroed in by the Japanese. So they would take and fire like any aircraft gun, just up in the air, nothing. And then the shells would start falling. And we had just a shallow pit. You couldn't dig anything in that volcanic ash, but about this high. And I had, uh, many times I looked up, and you'd see, poop, 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 poop. you'd see them hitting on the ground. And one of them came right across our gun pit, a string of them, and I reached down and pulled a shell fragment about that long and about an inch and a half wide out of my buddy's calf that was next to me. So um, there wasn't a safe place anywhere on the island. This may seem a little odd, but people that are going to listen to this, like myself, can only compare it to what they see on TV or in the movies. Do you think uh, that Hollywood has done a pretty good job of depicting what it was like on the island? Sands of Iwo Jima was, uh, they used some combat film in that with John Wayne, my good buddy. Yeah. Uh, they used some actual combat film blended in. And one of the best weapons that we had was, of course, we had flamethrowers, the individual men, but they they said, don't ever take up, if you're a flamethrower, don't ever take up reading continued stories because your combat life averaged 15 seconds. Uh, yeah, so the next best thing they did, they had, they mounted some of the uh, flamethrowers on tanks and they could squirt the thing twice as far as the guys that carried their pack. So that was a real good weapon, very right. good. Did you ever get to use the flamethrower? No, I didn't. Um, I didn't have any desire to, to carry one. Probably didn't want to touch it, did no, you? No, no. I understand. Um, how many days were you on Iwo Jima? Uh, from beginning to the end, I think it was probably about 35, something like that. And when they raised the flag, the famous flag raising, uh, we had a gunny sergeant from North Georgia, tall, lanky fellow, and uh, uh, just a little, I was looking at Mount Suribachi. They were dropping bombards and, uh, I mean, uh, napalm bombs on it and so forth, and all kinds of heck hitting it. And I happened to see a flag go up, and I thought, gunny, but we weren't too far away, probably a couple of hundred yards. He had a pair of binoculars, and I said, gunny, Put your binoculars on there, is that our flag? 
and I could still hear him like hearing you. He had that North Georgia draw. He looked, he said, it sure in the hell is. Well, when the flag went up, there were about 900 ships ringing the island. Uh, destroyers, battleships, cruisers, landing craft, transports, all of this. And you could actually hear the cheer go up and the bells ringing on those ships when the flag went up. And you could hear the cheer come up from the island. So it, it, was, it, it was a day I'll always remember. And Mount Suribachi, that was the big target, right? That's the high point on the island? The high point, yeah. I think it was mm, two or three hundred feet high. It wasn't very high. Right. Were there a lot of uh, Japanese prisoners left over? None. No. Excuse me. We, um... <laughs> Editing. simple things. My job at church is to make sure everybody's cell phone is turned off. <laughs> oh. I apologize. So see, were there a lot of Japanese prisoners left over after y'all, after you claimed the island, I should say? I don't think, I'm trying to remember, there were, uh, of course our division alone lost 5,000 men on the island. I mean, they were just killed, not wounded, including wounded. So that was one of every three that went aboard uh, ashore from our division was killed. And uh, luckily I wasn't one of those, those three. Uh, but uh, I remember going ashore and that you'd step in that sand and bulk up to your knee, that volcanic ash. And I had never seen a dead person up to that time. I just turned 18. And when I went ashore, uh, I can look at a wedding band right now and see it. This fellow was laying there, and his hand was up in there like that with the sun shining on it. It glistened. And I looked at him, and for some reason I had a mental image of his wife and two small children back home. So I looked, and I thought he was half covered up. He wasn't. It was like half a body laying there on the thing. So uh, that, that, was, that was tough. I can see that you never really become acclimated to that kind of scene. I wouldn't think you would be able no. to. After you left Iwo Jima, did you, did you say you went back to Hawaii or did you go directly went to Japan? Went back to Hawaii. Yeah. We changed off from the little 75 pack howitzers to 155 howitzers. And why we did, I'll never know, because that small one was the best weapon. In particular, when we got in Japan and found out, we didn't know where we'd meet there. We weren't there ready for combat. And we never could have moved that 155 through all the rice paddies, but the 75, we could have. And of course, we didn't. Um, so the larger one, was, was it a, a wheeled gun? Yeah, right, right. Yeah, the little 75, you could fold it up and take it just about anywhere. Right. And we had a saying, we had a rope that we could hook onto it, four ropes on the harness. And we said the Army used mules to pull those 75s. The Marine Corps used Marines to pull those 75s. <laughs> <laughs> so we didn't get along too well with the Army. How much of a break did you get between? Uh, How much of a break? Break between the two theaters. Well, that was uh, let's see, forty, uh, uh, probably about six, seven months, something like that. And then you learned you were going to Japan. Yeah, we went went to Japan, and like I say, we moved in to Sasebo, which was a port city in Japan. We moved in there, and from there we. Uh, at, at, we didn't even have a place to stay yet, so we fanned out in patrols and went through the towns. And at each town we'd go through, we'd meet with uh, the head like a Japanese policeman, the mayor, and we'd tell him to round up every weapon. We were in a truck, and we'd be back through there at such such a time and pick up every weapon. And we came back, the truck I was on, uh, I wasn't knowing, but I was on, I was waiting for the truck to come back. They had weapons piled in there, like you would fill a dump truck. I mean, they had the old blunderbuss type cannons that you'd have to shoot from the 
alongside of a canoe, knives, swords, rifles, samurai swords, and they started unloading a truck, and they had a bulldozer there. And I can remember I was second man from the truck, and they handed me this double barrel shotgun. I looked at it just like this. L.C. Smith double barrel shotgun with silver inlay with these pheasant scenes engraved on both sides. I passed it back. It went on a trash pile. Every weapon that piled up, threw diesel fuel on it, set fire to them. And they chewed them up with the bulldozer, ran back and forth. Then they dug a hole and pushed them all in there. But I'd have given anything for that shotgun. <laughs> I bet. What was the demeanor of the Japanese people? Uh, they were very nice to, to us. Uh, at first, they didn't know, uh, uh, really didn't know what to expect from us. Uh, they had been told, and this is the, the truth, that the only way you could become a marine, marine was to rob, rape, everything you came across. And they believed it. So they were kind of afraid of us, but the children weren't. But, but the Japanese found out that we weren't that way, and they were okay. And I have really, to me, an amazing story about one of the Japs I made friends with. He came, uh, we hired some after we moved in. The government, American government, hired Japanese to work on the base. And one of the uh, Japs, where I was, spoke fluent English. And one day we were talking, and I asked him what he did during the war. He said, uh, I was an uh, anti-aircraft gunner. I said, where? He said, at uh, Hiroshima. I said, oh, were you there at, well, at Hiroshima when they dropped the atomic bomb? He said, I was. He said, I said, you mind telling me about it? He said they saw this B-29 coming over, a lone B-29 by itself, no fighter escorts, no nothing. We didn't fire at it, now listen to this, because we thought it was a weather observation plane, and it passed on over me, and back behind me, this big blast came, and of course, they dropped the atomic bomb. Okay, now that's what he told me in 45, in the early 50s, I was at the Sanger Theater in Biloxi and going to a movie, and I forget the name of the movie, but they were talking about, okay, we got this weapon, how are we going to deliver it? And here were all these generals and so forth sitting around the table, and this one said, we'll do it this way, this way, we'll send the whole squadron to fight the planes. And one of them spoke up and he said, let's send it over. Now this is what the Jap said to me, but in the movie, this one fellow spoke up. He said, let's send it over. In a lone B-29, they'll think it's a weather observation plane and won't shoot at it. I sat bolt upright. I said, good night. That's what the Jap told me that was on the gun. That's incredible. Yeah. How long did you stay in Japan? Uh, about seven, eight months. Uh, went from there to uh, Nagasaki and uh, went through down there, I finally got put on the, some pretty good duty. I was in charge of a PX, post exchange, and I'd have to go down to Nagasaki every week and pick up supplies. And um, one of the best fights I ever saw, fist fights between the Marines and some sailors. I had beer in the PX, and it was limited to two cans per man per day. And they took over a little Jap, uh, we were at a Japanese air base. And they had a bar in there that was beautiful. And uh, what the Marines would do, uh, go in there, get their two cans of beer and set them on the table. It was all hot anyway. So they would sit there and take their buddies that didn't drink any beer and get theirs. So they'd always sit around a big table. But one night I was in a uh, PX office within an old Japanese wooden hangar and I heard the alarm go off, fire alarm, and couldn't figure out what was going on. 
and they had a fire across the rice paddies at a Japanese laundry. And of course, all the Marines were, about half of them probably, about one third drunk anyway, had to go and answer the fire alarm. Some of them got cinders down their back and so forth. Well, the laundry burned down because they were squirting water on each other and having a big time. Well, when they came back, the ones that stayed behind had were drinking their beer, and the ones that went didn't like it, the sailors. And they got into the biggest fist fight you'd ever want to see. And they called us, all of the officers from the Marine Corps, they called us, they had a group of old men, Japanese home defense guys, they called them out. They couldn't stop it. And uh, this little ensign from the Navy came running out, uh, CBs. By that time, it was the young CBs, not the old ones that we loved so much. But these young guys came out, and he ran up, grabbed this Marine. He said, you can't do that. And bam, he hit him in the drainage ditch, dry drainage ditch. He piled up three of them there before. <laughs> the incident? <laughs> Four of them, actually, yeah, before they finally ran out. And the way the fight ended, there was nobody left to fight. It was just all gone. Is that what y'all did for fun? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> what other activities did y'all do in your downtime? Um, what much else? Um, we. Um, My brother followed us over there, and he had a, uh, he was a shore patrolman, like a military MP. And uh, he had a Japanese, uh, he had a motorcycle with a sidecar at his disposal. So we'd go riding around and have a big time in that thing. And uh, he was also the one that met me on Hawaii in a tent. And my top sergeant came by one night first sergeant. He'd been in the Marine Corps about 30 years. And my brother, well, we had six cots, canvas cots in each tent. And my brother came by to see us. Top sergeant came by and he met my brother and they were sitting there. And of course, my brother would always bring the top extra beer. Well, they got pretty well uh, uh, full of beer that night. And he turned now this is my brother talking to my top sergeant. He looked at him, he said, Tom, this is my baby brother. And he said, I want to tell you, if you do anything to hurt him or get him hurt, you're going to have me to answer to you, understand that? And he'd grab, yeah, George, yeah, I understand that, I understand that. And finally, he would leave. I'd tell my brother, I said, look, I got to live with this guy after you leave. And I said, I don't know what he can do. I said, please don't do that anymore to him. But he'd do it every night. Yeah. Are there any um, officers that you remember fondly? Very fondly, yeah, right, right. Uh, one was Lieutenant Balloon from Dallas. And uh, we, <coughs> he was what was called a battery uh, commander. Really a nice guy. And um, we'd have, and he's going to set the headphones connected to him. And I would hear his fire command down many a time. It's going like this battery adjust, um, charge two, fuse quick, base deflection right so much, elevation right so much. And uh, uh, number two, one round. And I could hear that. Uh, well, that was in 45, and about five years later, I had to go to Dallas for a sales meeting. And I said, that's where Lieutenant Malone was from. I'm going to call and see if he's still here. Called up the phone. He answered the phone. And I could hear him sounding just like he did over those headphones. Then I started. Didn't say who. I said, battery is just. Shell H E charge two fuse quick. He said, Whose voice is this out of my past? And then, of course, he came to see me the next day, and we got to meet him. But he was he was a wonderful officer, wonderful. What about the other side of the coin? Were there any officers that you just did not like at all? We had one. His name was Oldfield, a full colonel. 
we called him Barney, Barney O'Field after, the, I think, a race driver. And uh, uh, we were cleaning when we got to these 155s. When we'd farm uh, or practice, we would have to uh, clean the barrels up and take the breech block. My job as a gunner was to take a little piece of the breech block out and clean it anywhere on the ground. And um, I, I was kneeling down and had a piece of canvas and oil and cleaning this part I had. And some of the guys had the, what they call a rammer staff running up and down cleaning the barrel out and you had to keep it horizontal. Well, they just started cleaning it up and they started cranking it up and <laughs> they didn't know who it was. But Boney Oldfield, the colonel, came by and he was on the gun. Nobody could see him because of the shield. And um, I, I didn't see him either. But he kept saying, and they started cussing, you blink, you blink so and so, lower the barrel. Well, they'd lower it, and the guy was trying to get the heavy breech block up. You blink, you blink so and so, raise it. Well, they kept doing this up and down. He cussing it, whoever was back there didn't know who it was. And I looked up, I said, my God, it's Colonel Oldfield, they cuss him like that. We'll be in the brig from now on. But uh, as it turned out, they finally got it cleaned out. They got it in position. They left. I went up to the man with the breech block. I said, you know who that was you were cussing? He said, no. I said, there he goes. That was Colonel Oldfield. <laughs> Boy. I can only imagine. But nothing came of it. Uh, did you ever, have you gone back to Japan since you were there as an occupying soldier? No, no. They've had tours go back to Iwo Jima, um, but uh, I had some of the sand from the island that uh, we were up in North Carolina a number of years back and happened to meet a lady who was in charge of the uh, museum at Okinawa. And she said she takes parties to Iwo Jima. I'll bring you some sand and mail it to you. So I've got one little block of it left on some stuff uh, I have. But I had several envelopes of it. How about Washington, D.C.? Have you been to, to the monument? I've been there. And uh, we have a daughter who lives out there. And I was at the World War II Museum right after it opened on Father's Day, I think it was. And uh, it's a wonderful thing to see. And of course, the monument, the flag raiser monument, is spectacular. That flag, that there were two flags raised on the two. island. Right, right, yeah. So by the time that the first flag was coming down and the second going up, was everything a little more relaxed on the island? The firing had stopped, maybe? No, no, it never it stopped. And they, when the first flag went up, it was very small, and they sent a runner down, and uh, the fellow was sort of tongue-tied. They called him Wabbit. And anyway, he went down. There was the LST on the beach, and he went in and got uh, one of the big American flags from the, somebody on the LST. He came back with it, and that's the one they raised, uh, the big one. Um, well, I mean, that was the second one, the famous one. What kind of contact have you had since the war with your war buddies? We had, uh, one of the biggest things, I had uh, two real close friends that were in my gun crew. And I happened to, uh, they had started going, they had an annual 5th Marine Division reunion which I never went to because I thought I'd never meet anybody. But anyway, some of them got together and they started looking for other people. And I found out that my best buddy in St. Louis was, uh, uh, I said, I'm going to try to call Mike. Well, his name was Queen. And of course, mine being Quint, we were side by side alphabetically with everything we did. So I went to see him, went up to St. Louis, called him. And when he walked in, uh, it was just like, hey, you've been on a three-day pass, so let's go back and continue the war. But he and his wife came in, and of course, me and my wife were up there to meet him. And from then on, 
would get together once a year. And uh, he died oh, a couple of years ago. And uh, several other fellows have. And uh, we had some good reunions, as many as seven, eight of us. When were you released from service? In uh, 46, I guess it was. Um, yeah, I think it was 46. And what did you do when you got home? When I got home, <clears throat> uh, of course, I took a train from San Diego to uh, New Orleans. I got off there. And then when I got home, uh, I had, I forget how many months on the GI Bill, quite a few. So I was waiting to get into pharmacy school and contacted Loyola and they were full for the coming year. And the next thing I did was use several months working on uh, building boats in Biloxi uh, uh, as a job because I still had plenty of time left on the GI Bill. Then after that, I went to Ole Miss and studied pharmacy. And uh, I still had a few months left over after finishing pharmacy school in 50. And where were you, a pharmacist in Biloxi? Uh, Biloxi, yeah, right. And when did you meet your wife? She was a lab technician, a medical technician at Keesley Air Force Base. And one of my best buddies uh, worked out there. He was a master sergeant. I got uh, got to know him. We were all active in the Junior Chamber of Commerce in Biloxi. He said, uh, when I see him, he'd remodel a pharmacy in the old wooden barracks at Keesler Field. And uh, I said, Buster, I'll come out and see him. So I went out to see him. He showed me around the pharmacy that he'd remodeled and stole half the lumber. He stole plywood. He stole everything. He could procure anything he wanted. Not steal, procure, we used the term. So he said, I got somebody I want you to meet. We went down. The place was not air conditioned. It was about 102 that day. Took, went down the hallway, and there was a laboratory. And, um, excuse me, he walked me in. He said, Annette, there's somebody I want you to meet. So when she got up and walked over to me, had a white uniform on, hair springing down. She was soaking wet from head to foot, shoes sloshing, uh, feet sloshing in, in the shoes. But uh, anyway, we went and had a Coca-Cola. And um, after I left, he said, Annette, this is my buddy, you're going to marry that guy. And she said, Buster Saxon, don't you tell me who I'm going to marry. So as it turned out, we did. But she wasn't a pretty sight that day because she'd been culturing all kinds of specimens in the lab, couldn't turn the fans on because of the Bunsen burners and so forth. So why ever ask her for a date? But she looked better cleaned up. She cleaned up pretty good. <laughs> I'm a little nervous. She's in the back of the room. <laughs> Let me ask you this question. How did your service to to, how did it affect your working skills, your 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 future life? Did it change? Did you have more discipline, or do you think, no, for it, example? I think probably the one thing it taught me was uh, I almost got in a few fights, uh, but it, it wasn't anything I initiated. It was stuff I got mad at, and I figured, well, I better quit this because uh, uh, but I didn't learn the skills on the service, except I did. I did learn some uh, jujitsu, judo, and a few other things that came in handy several times. Your generation has been called the greatest generation. I, I can't imagine that you would wish your service on anybody else in this world. Is that true? I mean, was it? It had to be hard, hard, hard to go through what you went through. I'm sorry. Was it very hard to go through that service? To go through the service? Right. Uh, oh, some soldiers did not have a, who had a pleasant experience? Nobody. But was it very um, hard to transition back? Oh, no, 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 no. Uh, 
You mean after I got back home? Right. No problem at all, no. Um, um, just what did they? No. What, what are the youth of today missing? I'm sorry? What do you think the today's my age, the younger people are missing that your generation has? Well, for one thing, they've got much more than we had. You know, we came out, we had just been out of the d Depression years. And uh, the one thing I always think of, had World War II not come along, where would, I, I mean, like I was in boot camp with a bunch of guys, really hillbillies from North Carolina. I mean, had never been out of their backyard which like most of us were, and had that not movement like that and interaction come along, uh, I don't know what would, have, what would have finally happened. So out of your class of 90 students, if 45 were men yeah, that went about, to war, yeah. how many made it home? Let's see, George, uh, most of them did. Like I say, my best buddy was killed on uh, in the Marine Corps, Peleliu invasion. Mm, a number were wounded, but uh, that's the only one I can recall offhand that was actually, uh, you know, killed. That's good. Mm. That's good. Are there any stories that you would like to tell that I that we've missed? Any stories? Uh, well. Uh, I had about three close calls on the island, if you'd be interested in that. I would. One, I knelt down at the gun site to uh, uh, get ready for a fire mission. And of course, what the Japanese were good at, there were bodies all over the place, dead Japs, before they could move them. And a lot of them would sneak in there at night, cover themselves with a blanket, and have what they call a little knee mortar to shoot. Also. Uh, some of them had pistols, sniper rifles. They'd cover themselves during the day with a blanket. A Marine would walk by and think they were dead. And uh, I had just knelt down for this fire mission, and I heard this zap, zap, and this bullet went eye level about right here and hit the sandbag right behind me. So that was close call number one. Number two is when I jumped in my shallow foxhole and the uh, shell hit right next to it. And my buddy came in on, kind of on top of it and knocked us both out. Uh, neither one of us hurt, thank goodness. And the third one was uh, up when I told you we brought our field piece up to fire direct fire up front. I had dropped back for ammunition. We had three rounds of what we call a clover leaf, and I had one on my shoulder. And on the northern part of the island, where everything else was flat, they had some jagged cliffs, probably ravines as high as the ceiling. And I had just come to one that was V-shaped, and had gone around this V, and I heard it flood in. A mortar shell hit right behind me, and that V saved me. It hit the stuff went right here on the side of me. But if I had stopped to sneeze, that thing would have hit me on top of the head. So. Uh, like I say, I had some close calls on the island. Were you a religious man before the war? Uh, I was after. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. Like somebody said, there's no atheists in the foxholes. Uh, no, I did. Uh, uh, probably wasn't a regular church goer uh, back then, but I have been ever since. I imagine there were some moments of intense prayer going on. Right, right. All around you, even. Oh, oh, yeah. One of the prettiest, I have a copy of the address that was given by the chaplain at the dedication of the 5th Marine Division Cemetery. And that was, oh, I think I got a picture of it over there. 5,000 Marines uh, out of our division killed. That was one third. And the address that he gave to me should be up there with Gettysburg Address. I mean, it's the most beautiful thing you'd ever want to read. And uh, I gave a, a copy I had of it to the museum in New Orleans, the DDA Museum over there. Mm -hmm. <coughs> Excuse me. Go right ahead. <coughs> Thank 
can you think of any stories that uh, yeah, I think that's pretty well covered. Okay. All right. So uh, what rank did you finish in the service? Corporal. As a corporal. All right. Let's see. Is there anything else, Janice? I was doing the work of a sergeant, but they didn't give up ranks too easily. Did you receive communication from home regularly? Oh, yeah. <laughs> one, of, one of the funniest things, now we're in Hawaii, and uh, we couldn't write home and tell the folks where we were, even though it was in the Honolulu Advertiser, the 5th Marine Division lands. We couldn't write home and tell them where we were. But, excuse me, I got a note one day. Now, we're in Hawaii to report to uh, San Francisco to the uh, Railway Express office and pick up a package. I thought, this is crazy. How am I going to get out here and go pick up a package? Well, what it was, I uh, wrote my note and said, please forward the package and anywhere it got there total of about a month after my, my mother had made it. You'll never guess what was in it. She'd fried up a bunch of chicken and packaged it in a box and sent it to me. So, <laughs> <laughs> it, it was edible. I <laughs> bet. <laughs> Bless her heart. Sounds like a good woman. Mm. All right. Um, anything else you would like to say? No, but it, it's I guess real, not strange, but the things I remember are the funny things. And we had a lot of funny things happen. That's uh, a blessing. Yeah. Like, uh, I better not tell you that one, but uh, <laughs> anyway, the, the guy, the day he fell in the latrine, my tent mate, uh, <laughs> that was terrible. Uh, we had been assigned, uh, they were just Johns, I mean, you know, 12 holes. And uh, should I tell you this? Sure. <laughs> okay. So we uh, had been assigned on a detail to dig a new hole on Hawaii. And right before quitting time, chow time, 5 o'clock, they said, well, we'll call motor transport and send a truck over and throw a cable around the old thing and slide it and move it over to the new hole. So we did, and in doing that, we had to put a few planks across the corners, kind of jockey it off. So we quit and finished, except that hole was open. That night, <laughs> my tent mate uh, and the water were freezing cold that night to shower. And we'd cover under three blankets at night on Hawaii because of the altitude. So he uh, <clears throat> he was walking interior guard duty, and moon, moonlight night, and just wandering around. And he came to these planks, and like a kid would do on the railroad track, well, I'm going to walk down the plank. He started walking across one of the planks, and it broke. Luckily, he was tall. And when he got out, when he came to the tent, if he'd have had ammunition in that rifle, I think he'd have shot everybody just for the heck of it. But when he came in the tent, I'm not kidding, the line stopped right here. He just could barely hold his head up and got to the side. And he looked like a creature from the sleazy lagoons. Looked like somebody had taken axle grease and just greased him all the way down. <laughs> and he had to go down and got in that ice cold water shower to clean. And the stupid guy was trying to wash his uniform out. I said, don't do that, Fitz. I said, throw the thing away. <laughs> you don't want to wear that. But anyway, that's one of the things I, I can really remember <laughs> very, very well. Well, I, we can't say it enough. We really appreciate your service. Mm -hmm. You and, and others like you have, have done a wonderful service for this country. Mm -hmm. Uh, and I appreciate it very much. Well, thank you. Yes, sir. Right. Well, thank, thank you very much. Right. I'm very honored to hear your story. I appreciate it. Well, I really am. <laughs>